<clears throat> so I've been on this whole thing um, in my other class about Bitcoin. If you have me for the other question while I was on it, and this computer has been mining it for a really long time. Well, for like two weeks, it's been mining Bitcoins or Satoshis actually. It turns out that someone died last month that was running like a Bitcoin wallet thing. And now all the Bitcoins are missing. Although, did you read this story? Like, like, there's like this whole conspiracy. They don't know if he's really dead and they think he stole the money instead. No, there's actually a real event where people are crying because of what happened. No, uh, so I mean, get this. So the guy's running like basically a Bitcoin wallet company. So basically he's like got all these wallets that people have and he's storing, like, how much was it? Do you remember, like, damn. So, like, people trusted this guy with the money. And the way that Bitcoins work is you have to have a password to decrypt all of the things. And he was the only guy with the password, apparently. And now he's dead. And they can't find what the password is. I don't know who's dumb in this situation, but... Um, I really don't know who's dumb or who's too trusting or who's, who needs that much Bitcoin? Seriously, like you can't be up to any good. Something's gotta be up, right? I mean, it doesn't matter even if it did crash. If one of you told me that you had even a thousand dollars in Bitcoin, I'm gonna think you're up to no good, at least in a little part of your life, which is fine because of your age group. But if you were like a person my age group, and you heard me say I had Bitcoin, I would hope that you think I'm like dealing meth or like something really bad, more exciting. Um, money laundering. <laughs> yeah, money laundering, yeah. Isn't the world a fucked up place? Mm -hmm. Like, I just can't get over how fucked up the world is on a regular, continual basis. People are mean. Like, people are shitty in like, the world's a crappy place, and I'm actually happy, like I totally am, but this is just another recurrence and a reminder of how shitty the world is, that you can't even trust the Bitcoin wallet guy. Um, not that you could have trusted him, but if you did, I don't think you're going to, I don't think anyone's going to really care what you did. Okay. We are on topic three. Um, which, if I've done my job right. Uh, when it's made, uh, <laughs> that's the easy answer. Um, no, in, in reality, um, it will, one more topic after, one more topic after this, and that would be basically the point when I would make the exam. Um, so I think as a class, don't, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, as a class, we voted that it would be due at the end of spring break. Is that correct? Or that it would be due before spring break? Yes. With the option to turn it in by, if you wanted to be turned in at the end of spring break. Okay. Um, so basically the end of spring break. Um, no, but usually the way that that works is I give someone an incentive. So I'll set up an incentive structure where There'll be two deadlines, one where you get an extra credit for having it done by the deadline before spring break, and then one where it's not. Um, I give you though two weeks. So basically, if you want to know when you would have the exam, start working on it two weeks before um, spring break. And um, everything has pretty much pieces on the exam is on the worksheets. Either the worksheets or the lectures themselves. Yep, worksheets or lectures themselves. So again, the way that we will do this is that every um, every topic will be basically try to break it into two parts here where it'll be 
a, um, a theoretical discussion and a um, mathy kind of discussion where we do the problem sets. So that'll be what we do. I want to be featured on one of these things at some point. No, I don't actually. No. How come I, it's not well staged? Of course it's staged. I mean, but how come no one ever asks me? You know, like, am I just not you know, like pretty enough? Like, what's the, you know, maybe I'm the, I don't know. No, it's all, it's all fixed. <clears throat> Ian, do you ever wonder about that kind of stuff or you don't give a shit? I don't give a shit. Okay. Well. I mean, I don't know what I would do. Like if all of a sudden someone had a camera and I had, I would like, oh my God, what do I do with my hands? Like, do I like, oh, what do I do? Okay. Um, it's true. God, how do I waste so much time? Okay, so basically at this point, then what we've done is we've done, um, we've looked at consumers um, and how they make optimal choices according to their indifference curve and their budget constraint. And now basically what we need to do now is we need to look a little bit finer at what the demand curve looks like. So this kind of finishes up our discussion of the consumer with this topic. And then we jump into the nature of the firm after this topic. So we'll get one chapter in for, or one topic in for how does the firm look, and then we'll have that first exam. Um, so our basic understanding was that The one thing we know, and the one thing you may remember from when you had um, principles was that the demand curve was downward sloping. And you may remember um, from principles was that kind of drop down graph, which is what this represents, although here it's kind of a drop up graph, which would be if I change the price of food, so what's happening here is that food is becoming less and less expensive, right? So food, if I keep the income the same and the price of clothing the same, but I lower the price of food, the budget constraint pivots outward and then outward again. These are obviously in difference curves, but now what's happening is that the optimal point moves from A to B. Then, what if I then redraw the graph where I have price of food now being represented and the quantity of food. Then point A corresponds to this, point B corresponds to this, point D corresponds to this, which is basically our way of using the budget constraint and the difference curve to understand why is the demand curve downward sloping. And for those of you who didn't have me for um, principles, um, you would remember that kind of one of the exam questions that kind of came out of this was, okay, then what is true for points E, G, and H? In other words, what's true along all the points on the demand curve? First, it was that each point on the demand curve represents a point of um, optimality where the budget constraint is tangent to the indifference curve. So that was one thing that we that basically every point on the demand curve 
represents the consumer maximizing their happiness. But also, what that meant is that as you went from left to right along the demand curve, is that people actually become happier. Now, the way I know that is because they keep ending up on higher and higher indifference curves. So from left to right along the demand curve, the consumer is getting happier and happier. Also, what we um, see is true, and you can kind of notice this, is that the budget constraint is getting flatter and flatter, which must mean that it's touching the indifference curve at a flatter point, which basically means that the marginal utility of food is falling. Or as another way of saying it would be is that as we go from left to right along the demand curve, that the consumer is getting less and less marginal utility of food, right? Ah, uh, I want to take a movie seven where that guy dies to eat the spaghetti. You see that movie. Oh my God, the guy died. They forced feed the guy to eat so much spaghetti and he died because there's like seven deadly things in his gluttony. Yeah, he'll be gluttonous. Uh, yeah, that guy right before he died would probably like, dude, this is not good. <laughs> um, it was way down there. Um, just saying. So what we need to do now, what we would not have done in uh, principles is looking at something called the price consumption curve. So we didn't really look at that. So what does the price consumption curve do? Is it basically links all of the points where we have the optimality between um, the indifference curve and the budget constraint. You kind of saw that on this right here, um, where it was this, where it was just combining all of those points together. The meaning of that price consumption curve, the significance of that, is that what it does is it starts to tell us a little bit about how we know that it typically is going to be U-shaped, but what it does is the, the, the degree to which it becomes a U, like how quickly it goes down to the bottom and then rises again, tells us something about how the utility is changing as it consumes each additional unit. Now, the point where I just said, what do we know is now true along the demand curve? This is just repeating what I just said right here. So that's what this is saying. So if you tuned out from what I was saying a little bit, um, you would see these things here. Um, with the exception of that. Well, I didn't say it just changes. I said it actually is increasing if you go left to right. Um, and the other thing I said, the third point would be is that the marginal utility of the product on the x-axis is, um, is decreasing. One of these is telling us how it changes with income. The other one is telling us how it changes with, I'm um, sorry, how it changes with price. The other one's telling us how it changes with income. How it changes with income, that would be the classic, um, so like, UH West Oahu, dude, we do good in the recession because right, we're a low price alternative, uh, a low price alternative. Right? So rather than using Miller or Shamnad or White Pacific, uh, we're a low price alternative. If the recession gets really, really, really bad, then they go to LCC and how we're the high price alternative. Um, and it goes the opposite direction for, for other goods, right? So um, not that your college degree is inferior, I'm not saying that, but Certainly, West Oahu does have some inferior like qualities in terms of price to number of students that come here and income levels in general and number of students that come here. But in general, we do pretty well when things are a bit rough. So, how do we see that? In this case here, what if I change the price of, well, I'm sorry, what if I keep the price of clothing and food constant, but I just keep increasing the income, then the income consumption curve is upward sloping, right? And what that does, right, we know what that looks like, because this would be a normal good, where the income keeps going up and people keep consuming more. So we can still do that kind of drop down graph. So you've seen this before, probably in principles. 
Um, but this is a normal bit. It would move the opposite direction um, if we were talking um, about inferior bits. And taking that a step further, what starts to happen is that it becomes backward bending instead of bow, um, going outward. So in other words, I can tell what a good, by the shape of the income consumption curve, I can determine what the good looks like. Now, this is very important what I'm about to say. The price consumption curve always has the same shape. Let's go back to what it is. The price consumption curve always, 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 always looks like this. And it has to, because it's all, with the exception of only one good and one good alone, as the price goes down, people buy more of the good. With the exception of only one good, it is always, 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 always this way. So this price consumption curve does not have an exciting shape. It is always, with the exception of one good, always that way. Uh, but the shape of the income consumption curve is notable. No one's going to ask what the exception is. Yeah, exception. Uh, thank God. Someone left it. Um, is the Giffen good? Does anyone? The Giffen good? That would be so cool, like Family Guy or like uh, Peter Griffin. Uh, remember the one where Peter Griffin was trying to hide his name and he like looked around at things to like decide what his name was going to be? And he actually said, he, do you remember? I'm sorry, but. Uh, and then you actually saw a Griffin flying around. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm sorry, but. Uh, Peter, how do we say this? Peter, there should be a class on like how to type in searches. Um, I don't even know if this will give me. Um, no, think, okay. no, that's like the second one. Oh, it's the second one? Okay. This one? What's your name? Uh, my, my name? Okay. Uh, 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 P, uh, 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 T, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Peter Griffin. Oh, crap. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, so, <laughs> um, no, uh, Peter Griffin, uh, this is the Giffen good. So there was this um, a long, long, well, back in the 1800s, um, there was this principles of economics test uh, book written. So it was the first basically college level economics textbook that was written in 1891. Um, it's called Principles of Economics. And in that book, the author basically was like summarizing, what did we all know as of 1891 about economics? And this guy who was like, um, I don't remember what his first name was, I forget his name, um, but, he basically had done this like research on the Irish potato famine, and he found, curiously enough, that as the price of potatoes went up, that people bought more potatoes during the Irish potato famine. It's an odd result, and it turned out to be quickly um, denounced because the Irish potato eater was also an Irish potato farmer, which meant that as a producer of potatoes, they were actually earning more money as well. Giffen's theory was that when your budget, when you become poorer and poorer and poorer, the price of these potatoes is going up and up and up. You buy more because the other alternative goods like meat become even more expensive. So you decide to eat more potatoes. But again, the, the farmer, the, the eater was also the farmer, so it couldn't be true. But that started a 100 year quest to find a Giffen good. Um, so for 100 years, people looked at like wrote dissertations on their search for a Giffen good. And finally, in like, I want to say it was like 2010, so in your lifetime, maybe this is a great time to live in. Uh, 
Um, no, sorry, it's just a spoon and six on the bottom. But, um, but it, you know, there, th this guy claimed to have found it, that there's a certain grain of rice in China where as the price goes up, people buy more of it because the alternative grains of rice, they don't know how to like prepare it or use it in their culturally significant recipes. So they still buy more as the price goes up. Um, I'm not sure that's, that's pretty rare. And I think one could even dismiss that as well because there's two only a certain grain of rice and a certain province of China. So I'm not sure how accessible that is. The price consumption curve always has the same shape. The income consumption curve has a shape that differs based on whether it's a normal good or a material good. This is a normal good. It'll be at some um, positive slope. But what happens for the inferior good is it becomes backward bending. So at some point, what you start to see is like, let's say, let's say this, let's say I had exactly $20 a month to live on. Okay. So that's not enough. Maybe that's enough to ride the bus like once a month. And that's like, if I get like, you know, buying a disease, and once I get to the <coughs> Queens West the fastest way I can, I'm going to take the number 40, right? I mean, like, that's like if I'm like really, really sick, though, that I would splurge and take a bus. But now, what if my $20 a month budget all of a sudden becomes $200? Now I might buy a pass, right? I mean, so that's what that's describing A to B, right? So even the bus in the very, very beginning of your income levels might actually hit, have some normal like characteristics. But you have to be really, 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 really poor for it to look like that, right? Where you can't even afford to take the bus once a month. For most poor people, it's more a description of B to C, where in our relatively prosperous economic time that we live in right now, right? The people on the bus are becoming creepier and shadier because most people now at least can afford a pretty used car, right? So uh, since it's creepy, it's more interesting and uh, it's kind of plastic. Um, I don't know how else to describe them. Um, but that, the, the era we live in right now is a B to C era rather than A to B era. The A to B would be uh, beginning of the 2008 crisis, right? Great Depression, like really shitty economic times. That would be A to B. Otherwise, we're in a B to C and backwards bending era. Now, the whole thing about rail, right, is dude, the challenge that rail has is trying to find some way to make a um, inferior good be a normal good, which seems like an incredibly hard task to do, right? Because now you have to make it seem like it's the cool way to get to town or the cool way to come out to the west side. Um, it's supposed to look surf racks and Wi Fi. I don't know. Well, public transit, if you ask me. Um, or, I mean, this is true of other things too. Like, um, man, this could affect all of you in this class, I suppose. Um, there, so the, the, the state legislature is in session right now. So there's a few economists, obviously, in the state, but there's not a lot. So I end up getting like calls to like, provide testimony at the last minute. I'm like stupid talk. Some are really important. Like one I did last week, which actually will help all of you for a lot of taxes, the 529s. Uh, there was a plan to make it tax deductible, uh, the contributions made to a college savings plan. We talked about last week with those corner solutions, uh, but I provided testimony that would say that that's actually a good thing, like we should make them, that the contributions tax deductible. I got this other call though, where they wanted to put a tax on, um, using Tinder and on um, porn websites. It's like, oh, that's so yeah, so yeah, I did not provide testimony on it though, um, <laughs> because it's hard, like, what, what economic innovation has taught me is that every time you try to do something illegal, all it does is it, it goes somewhere else, right? People aren't gonna be like, dude, I don't like hookup apps anymore because now it costs 20 bucks, right? Or uh, I'm not gonna look at porn anymore because now I have to pay 20 bucks a year. I mean, both of those activities are still going to happen. Um, they're just going to find, I don't know what you would call it, uh, I don't know what you would call it, maybe 
you call it something else and you repackage it so that it's stripped for $20, right? Um, I don't know what economists are telling the right testimony. Now I sound like the guy who is I don't know, the pervert citing um, who doesn't care that they do that. Um, but what becomes important for this, right? So no one's called me up about rail, but if someone had called me up about rail, right? That's exactly, this is exactly the challenge that rail has, is that you've got proponents of rail saying, dude, this is totally a normal good, right? That more people are gonna ride rail than cheaper we make it. And it's gonna be good times going forward. But again, it's gonna be really tough, especially when you're talking about a fixed system, where if all of a sudden people start, more people start living in Y now, right? It might seem unreal to us that people would be like that, but dude, think about 20 years ago, who was living in Kapolei, right? I mean, it was only the weirdos living in Kapolei 20 years ago, right? So it's probably only a matter of time before Y now becomes the fit place to be, right? Where all the slaves and cool stuff are, right? I mean, it probably is only a matter of time. But dude, real stops in Kabul. It's not where Prince too, right? Or how you get to the North Shore, right? At least you can take the bus, right? Now, what are you going to do? Take it to Mill Street and get your ride? Yeah, but the idea is that it's still going to be an inferior good. What tourist is going to want to take the rail everywhere they go? Um, just like what tourist takes the bus everywhere they go? Probably not many, especially if they're coming here for vacation. But even locals, who's taking the bus everywhere? I mean, you are if you have to, but for the most part, it's a pretty inferior good. No. The problem with that is that this gives us then the angle curves. The angle curves are useful for all y'all because um, you should, if you're selling something, you should know what these look like for the product that you are selling, right? So. Uh, obviously, Starbucks would know what these look like. Um, I would suggest to you at least that I don't think that the rail knows what these look like for the thing that they're selling. Um, I know that UH knows what they look like for students enrolling at UH, um, where we are mildly inferior um, of a good, um, but less inferior than it is for the mainland. So public higher education on the mainland is much more inferior than it is here in Hawaii. Uh, primarily because the private alternatives, even, I don't know, what's the best private university on the island? Shamanad probably, right? HBU. I mean, HBU. maybe HBU, maybe Shamanad, but both are like, I mean, it's not like California where you have a lot of really, really great private schools, and you actually have some pretty good public schools as well. I mean, here, it's hard to say, right? I mean, especially why is West Oahu growing so much? Like, how's it gonna go, right? I mean, went to the University of Phoenix outside of Silk for a second, uh, right? But there's not much else other alternatives. So we're still pretty um, inferior. But for all of you who would think about a career in the business world, you would want to know what these are for your thing that you're selling. Just like you'd want to know about elasticity, you want to know what your angle curve looks like. Because again, it's going to shape the marketing. It's going to shape the kind of products you deliver. Um, it's going to shape even how you forecast demand and link it back to how you think income is growing. Are these angle curves and how quickly it shifts from normal to inferior? Here, this is rather extreme, right? Where it's making it seem like um, that's more point. That in reality, these are generally a lot, lot smoother. So it's a bit more gradual than even what's appearing here. Um, so you see these things here. Um, these are just general estimates for different things. But again, you would want to do some marketing and try to figure out from various income groups what this looks like. Okay. Then we know the subsidies and complements. Um, again, going back to Adjacent principles, obviously you'd want to know what are your substitutes and your complements. Um, so let's go back to the real again. Um, I'm not, I'm just saying this is, I don't know, I really have, I'm never going to use the rail. I don't actually give a shit if other people want to ride it. I don't even mind paying for it for taxes. I'm not going to pay taxes. I don't, I'm not going to get all. Don't really about 
if we want some more taxes. Um, but, dude, I mean, wouldn't it be, what, so for instance, right now, the assumption made is that people that ride the rail are going to connect to rail using the bus. So people are going to ride the bus from their, like, get out of their house, ride the bus to a rail stop, and then ride the rail to wherever they're going, and then get on another bus to their final destination. Okay, what would be an easier way to get to work if you were still going to use a rail? It's not going to take a rocket scientist. I would counter that there are at least two different ideas, and I bet you some that, that someone in this class will get each of them, because not maybe both of them. But would be so I live in Manila, the rail's not going to go all the way to Manila. And let's just say there wasn't a station here. Let's just say it ended up on top of the a little bit less of it. How would I go from my house to work? I could take the bus, I could take number six. Exactly, right? So there's Uber is the one and one would be the other. I could drive to it or would I? Exactly, I could use the DT, right? So you would think that rail would then say, dude, we should get some like Uber thing, Uber partnership going on, maybe we should get some DT, like bike stations near these things. Uh, I don't think there's any of those kinds of things. Right, so again, how is Uber, right? Uber in this case is actually being treated as a substitute. Uh, dude, there's only like 11 of us in this class. It's not taking rocket scientists to figure out that. It actually might be complimentary instead of a substitute. Which would mean, right, instead of, I'm not saying that like this, you know, the city and county should be anti-Uber, but it actually might work to the advantage of rail to encourage Uber to exist. Uh, just like it could help, you know, tourism, for instance, if we were more like pro Airbnb or things like that, or again, the DT. Um, and I don't think I want to ride my bike to work. I don't care how far it is. Um, but I'll take an Uber. Um, but it would be useful to know these numbers. So if you're selling anything, you're going to need to know what your cross price elasticity is to figure out what is your substitute, what are your complements, right? When people get coffee, how often do they get it? And then what happens at Starbucks? Uh, what? Do people just get coffee or do they usually get something that's behind the glass? Say it's in the glass case that you see. Or what about the tourist centric Alamo on the same thing? I feel like it's true, it's right? Um, it would be useful to know. And that might also be, right, I'm sure someone at Starbucks knows if we put it in this zip code, they're going to treat these two items pretty closely. Now, what's the zip code do? It's a proxy for determining, right, income elasticities, price elasticity, to That's figure out. Exactly what they do. Yeah. All the different zip codes are different. All one of them is Oh, why, Kelly's probably like dirt cheap, right? Like Manoa three smiles and. What? Really? Mm -hmm. Well, because of all of us professors, probably, right? I mean, we're all like, it's, I don't know. Because <laughs> um, it's not that far from Manoa to El Moana. Um, yeah, because everybody struggles. It doesn't seem very right. But I guess it's a good from a business. <laughs> oh, God, you know what, that? I think I'm going to make a question off of that. Uh, if I remember to do it. Um, I will. Um, okay. Um, oh, but that's true though, because McDonald's, remember that like creepy McDonald's at the basement always had much more expensive uh, Happy Meals, the one that was by the post office, had much more expensive Happy Meals than the one in Manoa. It makes me think I live in like a shithole uh, area. Do you think it's because it caters more to um, the tomatoes and the locals? So oh, that's. That's true. It could be that. That's a nice way of saying it. Yeah, now I feel. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Less tourists. Yeah, because I don't think. I mean, I'm sure we have some Airbnbs, but who would pick an Airbnb as well? Like, it rains all the time. Um, yeah. Um, now, this is going to be new for everyone. So, we've already know about like the term again, complementary substitutes, and we know about income. But now I want to say something further here, which is, again, new for everyone, which would be when I lower the price of a product, a 
Okay. So we already understand this change in one additional way, right? Which would be the changing budget constraints, right? The drop down graph, basically, of how when I move from A to B, what's happening. And I'm just going to leave it at this, is that it's kind of the indifference curve budget constraint explanation, right? That was like, what, 10, five slides previously, it's like the drop down graph. Everyone know where I am so far? Yeah? You can shake your head. No, if you don't, you can get this. No, I still feel guilty even if I don't. Okay. Uh, this one right here, slide three. That's my, that was our first explanation of how we could understand a price change, for instance, to go from E to G. But now I want to say there's another way to understand E to G. And that other way to understand the movement from E to G is with this income effect and substitution effect. Any time the price falls, both of these effects are happening simultaneously. I if the price falls, so just think of your normal budget of what you buy, right? So if we live in the world where you have to pay $20 for Tinder, right? And you're paying $20 for Tinder every month, and you're buying 10 boxes of macaroni and cheese a month, and 20 coffees a month, right? All the things that you buy, and all of a sudden, I make coffee cheaper, then you will substitute more towards coffee. It's not saying that Tinder and coffee are substitutes for each other. All that it's saying is that the things that make you happy every month, Tinder and coffee are two of those things. And if coffee is becoming cheaper, comparatively speaking, you will substitute away some of the pleasure you get from Tinder and move it towards coffee. Substitute it. Change in consumption of goods, associated with change in price, utility, constant. So what that means, if you want to add like a kind of a sidebar here to what I'm saying, what that last part of that substitution effect is saying is basically that we are what? On the same indifference curve, right? Because that would say this low level of utility is being quite constant. For the income effect, what we're saying here is that I buy more of the good, in this case coffee, because even though my income level is the same, I feel richer, right? Or it goes the opposite way, right? If I'm used to Manoa Starbucks prices, and also I see Al Moana prices, I feel poor, right? Even though my income has stayed the same, right? Because if, if I'm not thinking, oh, I earn $3,000 a month, instead I'm saying, oh, I earn 1,000 coffees a month, but then the price has doubled at Al Moana. Now it's like I earn right uh, half that, right? So now instead of you know a thousand coffees, now I earn a five hundred coffee. My income hasn't changed, but its ability to buy stuff has changed. Both of those things happen simultaneously with the price change. Substitution effect again saying if something becomes cheaper relative to other goods, I will buy more of that cheaper good relatively speaking. Again, not saying that they're actually substituting one for the other, right? Tinder and coffee serve very different needs, but they both deliver happiness, right? And all I'm saying is, eh, if I want to be 100 units of utility happy, then I'm going to buy more coffee if it's, if it's becoming cheaper relative to Tinder. And this one's just saying, I will buy more coffee because I feel richer. What is this? This income effect. I buy more coffee because I feel richer. Will that always be the case? That I buy more coffee because I feel richer? Why would it, when would it not? Exactly. So 
the size of these effects will actually depend then on whether it's an inferior good or not. Because what we're saying here is that if it's a normal good, they're both going to work in the same direction. So for a normal good, let me explain what's going on in this graph. So you can just ignore this all for right now. Uh, actually, let me, how's this best? Let me do this. So I'm going to leave this up here. You can kind of still see it, but I want to draw it for you in stages. That way you can see what the finished product looks like, but then this way you can kind of see what's going on here. So imagine, Okay, so I've got a budget constraint here. This is a budget constraint, not a, um, sorry, it's a budget constraint, not a, um, I'll keep this, I'll keep this please. Okay, so with this budget constraint, and here's my indifference curve. Okay, now what we're saying is that food is becoming cheaper. So if food all of a sudden becomes cheaper, then it would pivot outward the budget constraint. Correct. So that's the action that happened here, is that the price of food fell. So that's this line here, RS, and then becoming RT. So far, so good. So it goes from that's kind of the first thing that happened. Everyone with me so far. To know what the substitution effect is, I want to draw a line parallel to my new budget constraint and have it just touch the original indifference curve. Meaning, basically, I could take a straight line and I just keep bringing it down and down and down until it just touches the indifference curve at one point. Mm. Obviously, this is not going to look exact, but you get this idea that this is now a different line here, right? Uh, which is the equivalent of this much better looking um, line right here, sorry, uh, unnamed spot to unnamed spot, which is exactly parallel to that new budget constraint. And the reason why I'm drawing that line is because remember that the definition of the substitution effect is keeping the level of utility constant. So what that's doing is it's, if the two lines are parallel to each other, it's reflecting the new price ratio, right? So the price ratio is now the new price ratio. The fact that the price of food is cheaper, but it's not touching the original indifference curve because if it didn't, right? There would be some higher utility function out here, which right it does show here you too, but I don't want to show you that yet. So basically, this squiggly line. Oh, geez, how do you spell squiggly? Uh, squiggly. Oh man, you know what, dude? I've been learning about all the parts of the English language that I forgot. Like, what's a predicate? Does anyone in here even remember what a predicate is? Exactly. I don't either. I've got a PhD, but I don't have it in English. But I'm sure random Moscow is in it before she knows. No, a predicate is what the subject does. So like the subject would be like the queen cries. So cries would be the predicate, the queen would be the subject. Oh man, it sucks. I've been learning so much. 
kind of cool, but yeah, exactly. Did you even remember what it was, Nicholas? Exactly. How often does someone come to the Noyal Center say, I need to find the predicate? I know what I was say. <laughs> but probably not very often, right? I don't even know what you're saying. I mean, do you remember being taught it in elementary school? I really don't. And I wondered if I went to like Gummy's elementary school or something or yeah, I think a lot of those things that we know like kind of the teacher and maybe the particular words that are used in them and how they're being used in That's probably true. Yeah. That's good. It makes me not feel bad. You're a good optimist. That's good I have your phone number so that you can be my uh my <laughs> crisis line person. Nicholas, I'm feeling really dumb today. <laughs> Let me feel better about myself. Uh, this quickly line. Basically reflects the new price ratio. So in this second step, I'm basically drawing a line exactly parallel to the new budget constraint and having it just touch the original indifference curve at just one point. Okay, so that's that's now we actually have something to say. Now we have a story to tell. So there's the original point. Which is my original point of optimality. Would everyone agree with that? A was my original point of optimality before all of this crisis happened. Um, now, the movement from A to D is then basically my substitution effect. Because all that that's saying is keeping the level of utility constant, how much more will I buy as I substitute more towards this group? So A to D is the substitution effect. Then we say, oh, it's like I'm actually richer. So now D to B is the income effect. The whole thing together, F1 to F2, On the demand curve, all we see are both the income effect and um, substitution effects simultaneously happening. A, B, C, and all we see is A to C. But what this graph does for us is it helps us understand how that can be broken down into two components. The substitution effect always, always, always works in the same direction. It's always, always, always an increase. And when it's a normal good, as it is here, the income effect adds to it. But let me ask you this. Um, um, what does the demand curve look like for the peak line rules? Is it downward sloping or upward sloping? The demand curve for peak line rules. Peak line rules, a very inferior good. Peak line rules, downward sloping demand curve or upward sloping demand curve? Not a trick question. I'll close my eyes so that I don't know what anyone's saying. What is it, downward sloping or upward sloping? Do you even change your voice as you're saying? Downward sloping or upward sloping demand curve for peak line rules? Did you say something? Say something good. Downward. Exactly. The fact. So inferior goods have downward sloping demand curves just like normal goods. Meaning that the income effect, even though it's going to work in the opposite direction, is not strong enough to overwhelm the substitution effect. The only exception to that is the Giffen good. The Giffen good, the reason why it's so interesting to some economists, 
is that the demand curve for a different good is actually upward sloping, which is what makes it so cool and interesting. <coughs> Your default answer should always, always be that demand curves are always downward sloping. And what you'll see here, let me just jump ahead to this here. <coughs> you see that here. This is an inferior good, is that the income effect works a little bit in the opposite direction, but it certainly doesn't overwhelm the substitution effect. Which basically means that even for an inferior good like cheap ramen or the bus or name your cheap thing, um, it still has a total effect that works in the rightward direction, meaning that the demand curve still looks like this. Our only exception would be the gift and good. Same story though. Um, let me just repeat it just so that we're all clear here. So this is my original point, point A. This is then saying that cheap ramen becomes even cheaper. And it's really cheap. So that means then that this RS becomes R T. Then I draw a line exactly parallel to RT and I bring it downwards until it just touches the original indifference curve. So it's touching it here at D. A to D then becomes my substitution effect. Then I say, okay, now I'm going to be on the new budget constraint, but I'm going to allow myself to be on a higher level of utility. And that would be B. But you notice that B is less than D. So that's where the um, income effect is working a little bit in the opposite direction and offsetting it a little bit. But I still go from A to B, which means I still have more food being purchased as the price goes down. So it still has a normally shaped um, demand curve. But this is our Giffen good. Um, dude, Giffen goods. Oh, jeez. Mm. Steely Dan. Jeez, who listens to Steely Dan? Oh, God. Does anyone here like? I don't even know this. Uh, does anyone know how this song goes? I don't want to listen to it. How about I do? Oh, God. It sounds horrible. Um, you know, music is subjective. I'm sure I listen to stuff that's annoying too. Um, what was his first name? Robert Giffen. Yeah. Oh, and it was 1890, not 1891. I'm sorry. Uh, that was pretty close, though. Um, so, yeah, so the example that's been found here is from 2008. Yeah, and again, it was in two provinces of China for some certain rice in Hunan and weaker evidence for wheat in Gansu. Hmm. I love this word. This is one of, I have two favorite words of the English language and this is one of them, farinaceous. Does anyone know what that means? It's like a bread. Uh, it's like, means like a crumbly, crispy, um, flowery kind of thing. My other favorite word in the English language is plenipotentiary. Does anyone know what that means? Plenipotentiary. It means that when, when you're the ambassador and you can't get a hold of the president, you get to act like you're the president of that country that you're representing because they can't get in contact with the other guy. I think that's kind of cool that there's a word for that in the English language. Plenipotentiary. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, the gift and good. So, what makes it a gift and good is this part. I'm highlighting right here. Basically, when you think of given good, think of the good being really, 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 really inferior. So inferior that the income effect actually overwhelms the substitution effect. And then it basically makes then the demand for the upward slope. Dude, you are never going to encounter a given good. It's hard to really. Um, About the, the, the best example you could really think of would be maybe if you're selling a good and there's a small subset of your consumers 
that want to dispose the good is what we what economists would call a bubbling good. So for instance, Starbucks coffee, right? I'm not picking on Starbucks here, right? But there's a certain cachet that comes with having carried a Starbucks cup versus a Tom's coffee cup, right? I mean, like in a coffee mug, an actual physical coffee mug. Right? You're saying, dude, I've earned in enough income in this world that I can afford overpriced coffee, especially if I'm buying it on one, that I can buy overpriced coffee from someone else making it. I don't have to do my own coffee at home, right? And if I then lower the price of, right, because we're going the opposite direction. If I then lower the price of Starbucks coffee and say, dude, any coffee you want is now going to be 50 cents. Now carrying that cup of coffee doesn't have that same cachet that it used to have, right? Because now, dude, what the what are three of you doing? Um, so, so now that the coffee is 50 cents, now no one gets any status from carrying a coffee from Starbucks. If anything, it says the opposite, right? You're now a cheap asshole who can't afford better coffee, right? Just like if I were to carry around like a McDonald's cup versus a Ruth Chris's steak cup, cup, I don't know. I'm trying to think of something on the opposite end, right? Um, right, but a fancy restaurant versus a cheap restaurant, right? So instead of carrying a cup, them? I don't know. Anyway, but right, but the idea is that you could say the same for Tesla, right? That maybe some people buy Tesla only because it's like a super high price car. And that the moment I lower the price, that people stop buying it. But the problem is that it doesn't work in the opposite direction. So so most Bevelin goods don't aren't Giffen goods, meaning if I made Starbucks really, really, really expensive, I don't think that more people would buy it. For example, right? But I do think the opposite way would work is that if I made it a lot cheaper, that actually fewer people might buy it, right? Because there's there's got to be a set of consumers that you probably encounter in various places, managers that you know only buy it because it looks fancy, not because they like it in any other way, shape, or form. So it doesn't work as well in the opposite direction. You're never going to encounter a different good. It's only interesting from a theoretical standpoint. That's all that it's interesting. But if you understand what this is, you probably know exactly what I've been talking about for the past 20 minutes, 15, 20 minutes. OK. Um, OK. Uh, what do I want to do here? 608. Okay, so let me just say a little bit more uh, about elasticity, but then I want to talk about externalities for a longer time. Um, I don't want to say too much about this, but this goes back to the idea that, as I told most of you who had these principles, uh, dude, you don't want to go into this world. In a being in a business where you don't know what your elasticity is. So you know, when you hear the word elasticity, again, you should be thinking of the word sensitivity. And if you are telling anything, you absolutely want to know what is the price sensitivity of the thing that you're selling. So for instance, we let me give you an example here. Now, let's say I'm moving. Is a U-Haul. An inferior good or a normal good? Renting a U haul. A normal good or an inferior good? Probably inferior, right? Because if I was money bag shiting, right, I'm not going to move myself, right? Right? I mean, the idea is that I would hire you schmucks to do it for me, right? I don't care. I ain't moving for money. But so we're just saying the overall moving experience, U haul, is probably an inferior good. Why? Among do-it-yourself people, is U-Haul elastic or inelastic? Among people who are moving themselves, so now this is a small subset of the, of the market. And my first question was, if I am moving, is U-Haul elastic or, I'm sorry, is it normal or inferior? And you basically just said, eh, it's probably inferior because only that only for people, but the poorer you are, the more likely you're going to have to move yourself. More likely. Among those who move themselves, 
is you call elastic or inelastic. Mm -hmm. Just think about the moving yourself market. Consider it. Inelastic? Yeah. I mean, there's not, I mean, you get that like creepy truck that you get from like Home Depot for like an hour at a time, right? Or you could find your uncle who's got a truck. But for the most part, I don't know of a lot of alternative rental of vehicle, big vehicle for day kind of places. So you all kind of got that market locked up, right? Which would mean that that, right, if you would want to know those two things, if you're trying to design the marketing strategy for you all, right? You might have to offer a lot of coupons, but somehow you need to convince people you can do this move yourself, right? So what does that mean? Uh, that would mean that you get the kind of vehicles that someone can drive, right? So it's not going to be like stick shift with like a big huge ramp that you have to go up, right? It's going to be like, look like a car that you're driving basically, right? It's going to have like a lift gate that like can move all your furniture up, right? You can rent all the supplies you need so that you feel like you can do the move yourself. Basically make it less inferior. Plus, right? Snazzy up the trucks, right? Make them not seem so weird, right? But don't give any discounts either, right? So now once I got you, where else are you gonna go if you're not gonna do you ball, right? I mean, even on the mainland, at least there might be some other places, but there's not too many. And in fact, some of you have seen this before, I've shown you this before, but oh god, this is a scam. So don't do this. Um, it's called the U-Haul Investor Club. Don't do this. If you have any extra money, don't do this. Okay, here's your standard U-Haul van, right? Nothing that exciting. Who in here has rented a U-Haul? One, two, two. Jeez, really? Oh, well. Um, basically, a U-Haul is, they're usually found at places that are really shitty and like really, uh, like, suspect they're not very nice kind of places but <clears throat> uh, let's look at this one All right so they kind of look like this right like some place it looks like it's got custom hitches um it's got some trucks outside now this looks a little bit fancier right like you might think oh wow this is a legit place but otherwise it looks a little sketch um now what if Oh, wow, most everything is rented out or bought out right now. Man, what are people doing? Um, God, I don't trust this world. Um, okay, I'm going to stop looking at this. Anyway, um, no, because it looks really sketch. Um, I don't see if any of you are ever thinking about going into the business world, or if you are wondering, dude, is the place I'm working for legit, and do they actually know how to run a business? If someone in upper management, again, doesn't know these numbers in terms of their elasticity and in terms of whether they're selling normal goods or inferior goods, I mean, this is how you structure a marketing campaign. This is how you structure a um, pricing structure. This is how you um, do everything, right? Which, go back to Starbucks here, right? I, even though I can make fun of it and whatnot, dude, they must be up to something good if they know that basically by zip code, elasticity is going to be different because one set's got local yokels and the other's got tourists, right? And there's even going to be the difference between the Al Moana tourists and the Waikeli tourists, right? Um, that would show that the place knows what they're up to and that they're clearly looking at these numbers where the zip code is basically acting as a proxy for what kind of people go there and what their general income levels, right? And that's used as a proxy as a shadow variable for me being able to make a generalization about what these things are, because that's going to affect my pricing. As I just said for you, for you all, that would mean that they don't have to give you a lot of discounts, but the thing they sell to you can't be that set, right? So basically means they have to still be a do-it-yourself place, but the thing they have to sell to you has to be accessible. So it seems like I can save a little bit of money by doing it myself, but it's not like impossible. I'm not going to take my arm and do it with myself. Um, that's the tightrope to walk to to walk there. 
And the reason why they don't have to do it is that if the thing they're selling is then inelastic, like you all knows their thing is, they don't have to offer discounts because they know if you need to do the move yourself, you most like, more likely than not have no alternative choice than recommending you all. Which means if they give you a $500 discount, it's not like I'm going to rent two you alls, right? Um, or it's not going to be like, dude, I think I'm just going to move, right? I mean, moving process itself is probably already determined. And if there's no alternative to you all, I'm probably going to rent it anyways, which means I don't need a discount. I just need to be convinced that I can do the move myself. Which then means you all probably aren't going to be that cheap, right? And they don't do a lot of advertising, right? Because when we think of the do it yourself move, even though all but two of you have um, never used U Haul, you all do kind of what I was talking about, which is doing it yourself, um, even if you've never used it before. So that's a pretty, even though I can make fun of U Haul, they clearly knew what kind of thing they were selling. But then let's look at the ones where they don't know what they're doing. Like, let's look at Macy's. So, uh, what do we know about Macy's? store. I don't shop there. Yeah, Brent. Yeah. Now they probably push their credit card quite a bit. Um, have, you ever gone, have you ever gone into one in El Moana? It, why does it smell like a basement or like a grandmother's house in that? It really does. Exactly. When you go in, uh, I don't forget what side it's from, but dude, it just smells like uh, attic or like a basement or like a library or, uh, but it basically smells old. And then what kind of customers go there, old or young? What would you know from your time of working there? Mm -hmm. Exactly, yeah. Geriatric fossils go to Macy's, which, right, poses, now what do geriatric fossils like to do? They like to physically shop at the store. They're not gonna do online stuff. They probably have enough income, so they're not like, really hustling for the sale things, right? But Macy's is competing for the same customers as Neiman Marcus, right? To step up, right? For Macy's, right? Same client base, right? But the Macy's experience, right, compared to Neiman Marcus, Neiman Marcus doesn't smell as much like a basement, right? It doesn't, um, right? You know how when you go into Macy's on that one side of the mall, and like the first thing you see is that like, shit show or like sale items the moment you come in, right? That looks like like teenagers like like in mass or I guess in this case 60 year olds in mass like took all this stuff off. Right? I mean it just looks crazy, right? And what old person's gonna want to navigate that? They weren't gonna shop in that area anyway. Right. So now I'm getting a different kind of customer. Why is Macy's failing? It's not bad luck. It's not even the fact that people are shopping more online because Contrary to popular belief, although Neiman Marcus is actually near bankruptcy, um, actually Neiman Marcus has been doing well in a relatively online shopping kind of world. The only reason why Neiman Marcus is going bankrupt is because uh, private capital firms screw them over. So it's not really that people are shopping less at Neiman Marcus. People are certainly shopping less at Macy's. And that's the whole story for Sears as well, right? Um, dude, no one goes to Sears anymore. Same with Kmart. Anymore. Sorry for all of you in Hawaii who loved Kmart. Uh, I don't understand why you did. But the rest of the mainland moved away from Kmart a long time ago. And you guys, uh, for whatever reason, didn't. Okay. Um, It's 6.20, okay. Um, I'm gonna stop here so we can take our break from now till 6.30, and then I'm gonna pick it up with a relatively new topic for all y'all, um, and that would be uh, network externalities. So I'll pick it up from here in 10 minutes. Uh, let me pause this, okay. It's good to know that Macy's, right, which one did you work at? Did you work at the one at the mall or which one did you work at? Oh, okay. Wait, someone was telling me, and I think I asked someone else, maybe you were in that section, that class too. So do you have to pay to ride that rail from like the one side to the other at the Pearl Ridge? How much is it? 
dollars per kid. I'm not willing to pay that. I just thought it looked cool that it was right at once. So I don't think it's worth a dollar per kid. Even if, I was lazy. Even if I was drunk and just wanted to ride a situation. Yeah, for example. How long can a business sustain itself after it turns on a lot? Oh, that's a good question. So, this is a really odd world we live in right now because there are enough private capital firms out there that make a company last longer than it is. Let me give you this back here. So in 2010, Sears had a market valuation of like $14 billion. So in 2010, Sears still was not failing. It actually was still doing relatively well. And if they had done the right things in 2010, they could have actually turned everything around and been like a Target, right? Target's still doing okay. But the difference between Target and Sears is that Target didn't go out to private capital. So private capital means that basically some hedge fund, right, some investors take over a controlling share of the company and then say, we are going to make the company do what we want them to do, which is what happened to Sears. So Eddie Lambert is this guy who runs a hedge fund, and he bought out most of Sears, which then meant that what he wanted to do was, and what he did was, he said, okay, Sears, you own a lot of property. We want you to sell all that property and earn a lot of money. And they basically created a spin-off company that owns all the real estate and they rented it back to Sears. So now this guy, Eddie Lambert, who's the hedge fund guy, the private capital guy, is now collecting all of the real estate that Sears created over a century long. And he's just taking all that capital. Plus, He's not investing a lot in stores because he doesn't care. He's going to be dead, right? So he's not going to invest for long-term growth. He's looking for a short hit, and then he's going to get out of there. Um, same with Blockbuster. Blockbuster Video, right? People actually still rent stuff, right? Like think about like Redbox. And I mean, there's stuff that is out there that isn't streaming sometimes. But Blockbuster, just like Sears, got bought out by a private capital firm. And then what happens is that music stops. So now Sears has nothing else that they can give as capital to Eddie Lambert. And so then Eddie Lambert's like, dude, just let it fail. I don't need this anymore. Same thing happened in Neiman Marcus. Same thing happened to Blockbuster. So if a company is almost failing and they get private capital coming in, or, or the other one, the one that just happened this week, I never went there, but that Charlotte Moose or Charlotte Russ. Lose. Yeah, what kind of clothes were those? Like women, it had to be women's, right? I never seen it. Like high scale, low scale. Okay. Uh, Claire's is another one, right? For every person that was getting their ears pierced, right? Is that where you get your ears pierced when you're a girl? Okay. Oh, sure. Oh my gosh. At the, uh, I hate going there. It's the worst Walmart, the one in Kiyomoku. Uh, yeah. I hate all those tourists. Like, if you eat tourists and you eat Waikiki, then you really should not go to Kiyomoku Walmart, especially in any evening hour. Some girl was getting her ear pierced at like 11 at night on Sunday night. Oh, God. Why did she do that? Anyway, um, yeah, Claire's. Um, yeah, Charlotte Ruse. So the companies that you typically hear failing actually should have failed usually, so to answer your question, usually about a decade ago. And they basically had 10 years in where some, usually guy, some guy swooped in, bought out a controlling interest in the firm, and then you just sucked all of the remaining valuable things from it before it actually failed. So usually 10 years. Give or take, which was kind of the blockbuster hit its peak in '99, and the, well, I think there's still one store out there, but it basically lasted about a decade, and then it failed. Um, Neiman Marcus is about to go bankrupt, and they got bought out in 2012. So it's about 10 years. Yeah. Good so I read an article that uh, it was based on GameStop. Yeah. 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 Uh, GameStop. Yeah. 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 So, like, uh, 
Yeah, that's another one. Yeah. And um, Radio Shack almost has a good time deal with GameStop, so they would combine the two. Oh. The market, but it's probably part of the market. Yeah. So, see, right, this is like the difference between Sprint and T Mobile, right? Sprint is also failing. Fortunately for Sprint, T Mobile bought them out, right? For GameStop, uh, right? And Radio Shack, although it would have been kind of a shitty marriage, it probably it could have possibly worked. It really saved it because what happened then first is that Radio Shack goes down. GameStop, I mean, it's the same thing. It's the capital, the private capital is not going to save GameStop. GameStop will not exist. Um, it would be like saying that Radio Shack would continue to exist. Um, but the only ones that can really survive are the ones that have such a strong name. Like, like maybe a Neiman Marcus, but see, this is the thing. Why is the Sears bankruptcy so surprising? Is because most people would say that the name is so strong that it would be able, able to overcome going bankrupt, right? Or even think about like here on the island, right? Sears is left in almost all practical ways, except they still have that like mattress and appliance place that's at the bottom of Almoana. But what's the other thing that Sears is known for? Think about this. What's the other thing that they're known for? Mattresses, appliances, and one other thing. What? Yeah, as a retailer, when you think of the reasons why people go to Sears, I bought my mattress at Sears. Uh, that's on the mainland. I bought my first mattress at Sears. Uh, my parents bought their lawnmower and washer dryer at Sears. And what's the other thing that's the classic American thing to buy at Sears? Think of your father's. Exactly. Tools. Yeah. Crafting. But, so the unfortunate thing is that when they were owned by private capital, Eddie Lambert sold off the appliances to Home Depot. He sold off Craftsman line to someone else, right? And so now they got into mattresses, uh, which is now like yeah. the last thing, right? It's probably only a matter of time. So see, this is the thing, right? Is the problem is that it's really hard, like when Radio Shack was failing or GameStop is now failing, it's really, really hard to say when you, and you just throw out this like blanket excuse of like people are doing stuff online. Like it's true, people are buying stuff online, but Best Buy is doing actually pretty well. I mean, it came close to bankrupt, but it didn't. Circuit City did, but Best Buy did not. So what's the difference between those two? Circuit City, private capital swooped in, and basically leached all the capital out of it because they wanted to get paid first and then they just let Circuit City fail. Best Buy, largely owned by the person who made, who founded the company and he basically didn't sell out. He said, no, we're gonna fix this. And so it's short term, your, how demanding are the people who own the stock? Do they wanna get paid in the short term before the ship sinks? Or are they willing to take the risk that the ship might sink but hope that they can ride it out. Which is kind of different between the Best Buy and the Circuit City. Uh, but I predict, if I had to make a prediction, GameStop will end up like Radio Shack and Sears and not be a part of it. If I had to make a guess. The big story this year, from an investing perspective, is going to be the unicorns. So unicorns are companies that have a really high valuation um, but they, and they might have a lot of sales, but they're not publicly listed yet. So it'd be like Uber, Airbnb. Um, there was a professor that went, went private last year, like for us as academics, it's always hurtful when one of us goes into the real world to get a job. He taught at Manila. He did, he was in the English as a second language department, and he now works for Duolingo. That's like that app that you download it, like you do like a new language and it seems like a game. Uh, Duolingo will probably, so there's a whole bunch of these 
So let's do Uber. Uber is valued at $63 billion, something like that. Uh, that would be the biggest IPO ever. Um, or the one that's really cool, Slack. Has anyone ever used Slack? Such a cool thing. I've never used it, but it is so cool. Oh my God, we should start. But I should show you this um, because it's a really cool commercial. Uh, and I don't generally like. Yeah, Brent. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. You mean like that I as an employee would know what my benefits are or that or that when I from time to tell someone to work for the state or the city county that they wouldn't know what the benefits are. Which one do you mean? Or maybe both. Uh, so are or are you saying or like public like a publicly like uh, like a publicly traded company or like a or what do you mean? Like give me an example of a company. Or so for a federal oh, it's rude. Uh -huh. rate. So in order to attract uh, better talent or mm -hmm. you know, less talent, how would they let people know about okay, well we have these benefits and I went online that for some reason they don't do a good job. Mm -hmm. Seriously. Um yeah, you know, it's surprising. So I am a state employee, obviously. I'm actually also a union rep. So that would mean that there's two union reps on this campus. All, all faculty, almost all faculty members, full-time faculty members are unionized. And there's two of us that are the union reps, which would mean, let's say you were part of the union, but you had like a question about your benefits. You would come to me if you didn't want to go to HR, right? So it'd be like, it's really complicated and more people than you would expect because I'm dealing with PhDs, right? Like full professors. There are more people than you would expect that have no idea how their pension, like what kind of benefits it pays or what their healthcare choices are, like health insurance choices are. Like, I think the reason why, the best guess I have of the reason why is that Benefits are generally harder to understand. My wife's job where, I mean, there are some benefits, but mainly it's not like it's physical money. It's much easier to, you know, to describe, like, I don't know. So a professor, anyone want to guess the average professor makes here in Hawaii? Just take a guess. Yeah. Yeah, a little more, not much more, but about 100. Um, you know, and you might think, well, I'll turn this little risk, right? Uh, but that's actually not, I mean, I make less to my wife and my pay, my physical pay is not the primary thing. So the primary thing that I earn are benefits. It's just hard to understand it and quantify it. And especially as a younger-ish, right? Like actuarially I'm younger than the rest of my colleagues. So um, not all of them, but right, I mean, dude, who wants to think about like my pension benefit? Which is actually, as friends pointing out, it's a pretty valuable benefit. Like, I don't have to do anything to save for retirement, and I'll still get in retirement about 50000 a year. And I don't even have to pay for health insurance. All right, so basically, I don't even have to figure out how to save for retirement because the state, and unfortunately, the taxpayers do all the work for me, and I don't have to do anything for it. Unfortunately, it's real, and I know a lot about the pension, because you know, I'm an economist. But so I already know more, right? I'm not going to be like the kind of employee like, oh, the pension's not going to exist, right? Like, I know what's going to be there. I know approximately what it's going to pay out. And I know approximately how much I have to pay into the pension to get it. That's already assuming a lot. Isn't it easier if you're someone like my wife and you just say, dude, you're going to get 200000 a year, right? That's easier to understand, right? That you get 200000 a year and, right, most of my pay is not physical pay. Most of it is benefits that are harder to digest. So one reason why the state doesn't do it is because, dude, it's really hard to explain, especially to a 25 year old. So the average state employee works for the state, anyone want to guess? How long does the average state employee work for the state before they move on to something different? Three years. About 10 years. 
mostly seven between seven to ten years, which is why to be in the pension to be vested, you have to be with it for ten years. So basically, it's trying to make it right push people to stay a little bit longer. Why do people leave after seven to ten years? Because it's tired of being poor, and right, and then someone's like, instead of managing construction projects for the state, why don't you help us build this mall and we'll pay you three times as much, right? And then you're like, hey, yeah, right. I mean, who cares about cheap health insurance, right? Um, yeah. So that's a big part of it, right? And and I'm in a higher paying state job, right? Let's talk about the one like in the area where you used to live, right? Like public teaching, right? At like the elementary, middle school, high school level, right? Right. Those tables are right? 20, 30, right? I mean, 20, 30, 30? I'm not even sure, but I know. Uh, I know well, I'm sure they are. It's probably really, really, really low. Um, but it's easier if you, well, right, Starbucks is the same thing, right? Pay is kind of shitty, but dude, you get really cheap health insurance, right? Right, really? I thought it was really, really cheap. Or is it health insurance is really cheap, but if you're looking at personal, race wise, it's not good. Yeah, but that's not why it's not good pay, right? Exactly. Yeah. 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 So maybe you should, okay. Um, so we're talking about unicorns. Not the cool thing. We're talking about investment unicorns. I love this commercial. It's my favorite. Com okay. On all kinds of teams, use Slack to do amazing things. Dude, this store, this company, Slack, has a really cool backstory. So they were these video game makers back in the early 2000s that were designing this really complex video game across like lots of developers. And they basically developed the in-house, what Slack does is it's like a, I could send instant messages to my colleagues that were all working on a team project and say, make a flying umbrella, right? And then Walt Loggins goes out and like makes the wood and all these things happen. Well, that's what they used to do for making this video game. The video game failed, but they were like, dude, I think this thing is actually very valuable. This messaging service we have, this basically I am kind of thing that we have going on. And that's the unicorn that probably will have an IPO this year uh, as Slack. Oh, there's an extended version. Oh my God. Uh, <laughs> the extended version is really cool too. Uh, maybe, is this the longer way? This is the one minute one. There's a slightly longer one where they do something really, okay, I'm gonna click on videos. It could be offensive. I'm sorry if it is uh, animals. Sorry if it's offensive. Okay, wait. Uh, I want to go the longer one. Okay, I'm going to go a minute ahead. Okay, this is where the other one left off. <laughs> That's
my god, are those actual dogs? Okay, I'm not gonna watch it, but I'm kind of curious. Play it, play it, play it. I don't want to actually see them. Oh, come on, this camera's just at a low angle. The dog, of course, is gonna look big. Should be bred with the size it needs to be effective. Join us as we take a look at 10 of the largest dogs ever. Okay, come on, that's not that big a dog. Hulk, the pit bull. Okay, I'm not gonna watch that. I'm sorry, but that dog's not that big. Um, yes, gets it at the end. Oh, God. Come on, dude. <laughs> okay, let's go to the end. That's not that big either. Yeah, it's just a big dog. It's not, big dog. It's not abnormally large. Oh, these are always cute animal odd couples, right? Ooh. What's it got? A kitten with a chimpanzee? Oh, come on. Who doesn't like a. Okay. <laughs> anyway, network externalities, that's where we're on now. So uh, let's do Slack, for instance. So, um, so the way that Slack, again, would work is that it would be a. Um, so the reason why something like this is. Um, so the reason why something like this is particularly useful to network externalities um, is because, um, especially for digital goods, it only becomes useful to more people that are using it, right? So all those animals had to be using Slack for the messaging service to become valuable. It's just like Facebook, right? It's only as valuable as having lots of people on it, right? And it also works the other way though too, where so many people use it too. The, all the cool people have already moved on to something else. Right now our grandmothers are on Facebook, right? We can't even share it because we don't want them on our business, right? So right, Facebook is no longer the cool thing. Uh, fortunately, it's moved to, for Facebook, it's moved to other Facebook owned properties like Instagram um, that people are using. I don't know, what else do cool people use? Instagram, what else do people use? I mean, Facebook, and Facebook's so old that I use it, so that, that I don't use Instagram, I don't use Twitter. Uh, what else do people use? What? Snapchat. Uh, is there anything else that we don't know that Facebook people are using? What is it? TikTok. TikTok? What's that? Oh, is it the six second thing? Like Vine is a six second thing, right? Yeah, kind of, kind of. Okay. Okay. Um, or, or like, oh, remember that really cool craze like last year, the year before, uh, trivia at HQ. Remember that cool thing? I think the guy like, like did a drug OD and died. Um, no. Trivia at HQ was cool because right, you would log in once a day, you'd watch the whole thing, you'd can't answer all the questions, and there'd be that. Oh, shit, that's right. I yeah. remember hearing about that. Exactly, yeah. So man, I was doing it right when it came out, but dude, I didn't do today's. I haven't done one for like a year and a half, two years. Because right? Wow. Yeah, then you would yeah, he's like painkiller or something like that. Uh, schedule ones, I'm guessing. Um Facebook. The value of Facebook is the number of people who use it. That is the network externality. The, the thing becomes more valuable the more people that use it. Like a fax machine. Dude, my wife's industry finance is so outdated. They still rely on voicemails and they still really, really, really rely on fax machines because things have to be signed, they have to be physical. I think they're the only ones that still buy fax machines, honestly. And so, like, when my wife has to get something signed, more often than not, if the client the client does not have a fax machine, right? And that's just the way it is, right? Because dude, who uses a fax machine? Um, I wouldn't even know how to send a fax. Go to a bank. I don't know what I would do if I had to send a fax. Uh, go to my wife. Um, but, what? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So yeah. So the military is probably is a big. Uh, right. It's just like. Um, well, you know, even like, again, like when we think even of like, oh, remember like when cell phones first came out, like, or like long ago, and like if people were on this thing back, back before everything was on Windows, does anyone remember those days? I do. But remember, like, if you had the same network, it wouldn't count against your units. Do you remember yes. that? Like the T Mobile yes. Friends and Family, remember that one, right? 
So then everyone would sign up for T-Mobile because then whenever you would call them, it wouldn't count against your minutes. Oh, I remember, oh, who was I date? Brooke Cameron. She and I both went on T-Mobile so that when we would talk to each other, it wouldn't count against our minutes. So I still remember that. Um, or Nextel, remember the Nextel walkie-talkie like phones? Remember those? The ones where it's like, where are you at? Remember those? Yeah. And that was the cool thing too, because then you hit the like the walkie-talkie thing, and you could immediately talk to someone. Or having a BlackBerry. Or today's equivalent would be, if right, if I have an iPhone and you have an iPhone, I can see when you read the message. I can see where you're at. Like all right, it'd be a total creeper, right? If you have an iPhone like myself, right? Samsung's and if you don't, then I can't. What? Samsung's doing it now. Right, so Samsung probably realizes the benefit of doing it because then if I have to convince someone to do it, right? I mean, one of the benefits my wife and I both having an iPhone would be, right? If she just said, dude, like go pick me up, right? And she's gonna say, just pick me up where I'm at at five o'clock. I can just go on, right, on message, right? Find out info where she's at because she shares the location with me and be like, where? Now I don't know where to pick you up, right? Like we could only do that because we both have an iPhone. So the iPhone is valued more valuable because there are more people that have, right? Or I can get pictures with her more easily. Those who have an Android device, it doesn't look as good, right? It's just a green bubble instead of a blue bubble. I can't see if you read it or not. All the other things. Same with like Facebook, right? So for Facebook, um, I don't know, right? I mean, for my friends, unless they reveal it to me, I would never know what their private email address is, right? How do I contact them if I want to write them something? I do a message, right? Messenger, right? And again, that's the whole value of it, right? So I don't want to give like Creeper Cody what my private email address is, right? I'll be like, dude, just go on Facebook and send me a message, right? And if he's been really Creeper, right? Then I just block him, right? And now the relationship is done, um, right? So that's much better than giving your new girlfriend or boyfriend your private phone number, right? Give them like your, right? I'm, right? There's gotta be some Facebook product out there that would, right? I mean, Messenger would be a perfect example of something that um, I can do well. Um, this is basically, uh, to a large extent, these are important because this is largely what um, gives value to a lot of the unicorns that are out there today. So when, again, when I'm saying unicorns, I'm talking about companies that are not public yet, but the value of them, they have a really high market cap, but they're not, they haven't gone public yet. Um, I guess something like that would also be something like even um, Uber, right? Uber is valuable for the most part because almost any city of any substantial size has an Uber presence, right? And on the mainland, where distances are a little bit more separate, right, you would know you're a rural community if you don't have any Uber presence. But again, the network effect is that the value of what Uber provides as a transportation alternative becomes greater the more people who use it and the greater geographic space that it can see. So it's like email, right? What value is email if you don't have an email address? So the more email addresses that exist, the more valuable it becomes. Um, And then that's again our kind of our bandwagon effect is that the more people who use it, the more valuable it becomes. So that's the story of Facebook. And again, what we basically are seeing here is that <coughs> the demand is shifting as the good becomes more popular. So if you look at the growth of Starbucks over time, it becomes meteoric because once you get so when I for oh, let's see, let's think back. I signed up for Facebook in 2003. 2004? Was it 2004? I think it was 2004. Dude, when back in the day in 2004, it was nice. Like your parents were on it. Uh, it was just other people you knew who had big schools, and um, there were no weirdos out there, and everything was pretty uh, easy. Um, but again, when did that shift, right? It shifts in the later, like 2007, 2008, 2009, when all of a sudden everyone's got it, right? I mean, so it's becoming more valuable as a communication device, just like Twitter is. Um, 
But again, the difference is that um, if it would start to work in the opposite direction, right, where the studies come out. So the study I read uh, Sunday, so a study came out, how much would you pay to not use Facebook for a month? How much would I have to pay you to not use Facebook for a month? Like, how much would I have to pay you to delete the app on your phone? Saying that after a month then, you can put it back on your phone. But basically, you cannot use it for a month. How much would I have to pay you to not use it? $30. Yeah, five. That's it's so it's going to be different for about everyone. So the cool, so there was a study done. So one cool thing that was discovered was that they, they asked the person before they did it and after they did it, and they found that the value was about the same, meaning that when you didn't have it for a month, it wasn't that you're like, oh, geez, I didn't need, right? Not like a bad break, where you're like, I didn't need her, right? Like, and then you have like a total change. So it wasn't like breaking up with Facebook fundamentally altered the value. But if my memory serves me right, um, I thought it was, I thought it was about a hundred, it was either $20 or a hundred dollars. I don't remember what value it was. It was either $20 or a hundred dollars that you would have to be paid a month to not use it. And then people did reinstall it. But I would have to think that Facebook really cares a lot about what that value is because I mean, think about it. We've probably all at some point in our life said, dude, this month is going to be a Facebook free month for me, or like a Facebook free week at least, right? And I don't know about your feelings about Facebook, but I think I've been noticeably happier when I haven't been on Facebook, right? Um, and I don't even do a lot on it, right? And I'm sure you've all had some point when you did it. But think about it. If you're Facebook, dude, that's really, really bad that people are saying I'm going to explore not being part of it, right? And that that value is giving me some indication of like how much I need it or not. Same with like Twitter, right? I mean, Twitter, dude, Twitter's just full of cyber bullies, right? I mean, that's all that it is. Um, but again, that becomes kind of um, valuable for us. I don't know why it's so. Um, oh, and then there's this, the snob effect. Um, so the snob effect works where the fewer people that have it, the more that it's wanted. So this would be your classic, oh, let's see here. I don't think the men will know this. If you had to think of the most valuable handbag name, the most exclusive kind of handbag you can buy for a woman, what would be the name of that bag? No. What's the be? A Birkin bag. A Birkin bag is pretty, pretty valuable. Um, a Birkin bag is known for being hard to get a hold of. And um, even if you are lucky enough to buy one, um, yeah, so Birkin bag. Um, that's a pretty expensive. Um, so twelve thousand to three hundred thousand dollars. That's on Wikipedia page. Um, yeah, exactly. That's pretty expensive. Um, I knew someone once that had a Birkin bag. Um, hmm. Yeah, but that's what she wanted, and it made a lot of sense. It probably fit her personality. Um, Birkin bags, you know. Uh, pretty expensive, but the reason, I mean, if you look at the bag, right, I'm not seeing, I mean, I don't, I've never owned one. I don't think I'd have any desire to own one. Yeah, it's hand, I'm sure it's handmade. I'm going to guess it's handmade. Yeah, handmade in France. Okay, but even if it's made by hands, I don't think it's going to still be worth, for the cheapest one, $12,000. Unpredictable schedules, limited quantities, creating artificial scarcity and exclusivity. All of those are the characteristics of something being snobby, right? Unique, exclusive, hard to get, right? Um, oh, remember when Starbucks had that like really flowery, rainbowish colored drink that had like a whole bunch? Yeah, what was that? 
and they stopped it right away. Um, it was for the day, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, geez, I really wish there was a class around here that was about Google searches. Really colorful Starbucks drink. I don't even know what the type. Uh, yeah, I mean, it has to only be a one credit class. I mean, is it a is it called just a rainbow drink? Oh, it's a pink drink, maybe. Oh, was that what it was? It wasn't that long ago, though, right? Yeah, this one. Yeah, yeah. Was it really? Yeah. But everyone wanted it, right? Was that the idea? Or Uh, wait, it's coming back with a twist. Wait, oh wait, this is last year. Mm. But they have star craft appearance that come like every every like other day. Oh, I can make it myself. Um, <laughs> it's got to have a lot of calories. Uh, oh, anyway, uh, right when you're like Starbucks and you've got everything everywhere. You've got to design a unique drink like this that people are going to want to buy. Oh, or like McDonald's. What's our uh, unique thing there? No. Portuguese sausage? No. What's the thing that, like, I don't like to eat it, but what's the thing that, like, people who love McDonald's, like, they want a certain thing? Yeah, Brent, yeah. The teriyaki or the McRib, right? Those, like, two things that people have to have. And it only comes out like once a year and like, or twice a year. And yeah, it's a way of basically not putting it out a lot and actually trying to make it more exclusive so that people have to buy it. Well, so um, I wish we could update this here, but I'm not gonna take the time to do it. Um, but this, right, obviously what we're seeing here is that as the number of users go up, wow, I've been on it since it was that young, wow. Um, And I don't remember when I really started using it a lot, but I don't, anyway. Um, it's used more as it's, um, okay. Um, I like this example. I do like this example. So what about the brands of cereal that aren't that popular? So this is the one where it's like shredded wheat and, um, Great nuts. Oh, bother these great nuts. Um, I mean, great nuts are okay, but dude, we're not talking like cinnamon toast crunch here. We're talking like great nuts. So the problem, right? So great nuts as a as a I mean, think about it from again. I know most of you are business majors, not econ majors, so I provide you this kind of example just to think about it. Is that the same company that makes like old dying thing like grape nuts as a product that post cereal also makes other things that are obviously more popular and so they have to now somehow build up a menu of different products they provide that have very different elasticities and are very different kinds of products and think about how do i cross market them right so for instance nabisco sells both rich crackers and oreo cookies Right? Mm -hmm. And yeah, so the Visco sells both of those things, right? So what is the relationship between the two of them? Are they substitutes for each other? Probably not, right? It's not like you want a rich shirt and you're like, ah, I guess I could have a cookie as right. I mean, most of the time that's not very substitutability. It's certainly not complementary either. So then you have to think about what else do I sell that's kind of like that. Um that my thing could go with, right? So then you start to think if you're a cereal, right? And maybe then you say, um, well, actually the best one that does this actually in this case is Kellogg's. So Kellogg's makes both Pop-Tarts and cereal and waffles. So they basically own the breakfast space with products that really aren't competing with each other. Um, and they've done a pretty good job of doing that. Or even companies like um, Mars that sell um, candy, but a very broad, a broad swath of candy. So they own both um, 
M&Ms, and they also own Skittles and Starburst and a whole host of things where if I'm eating Starburst, I probably also like Skittles, right? And if I offered you one, you probably would take the other, right? But what that allows them then to do is say, dude, when you're in the mood for like a fruity kind of candy, we are not own that space, but then they have M&Ms, they have Twix, so they also have the chocolate space as well. So they've got both sides of it there where they basically own that, um, I guess what we call that candy space in a way much more so than Hershey's, right? So Hershey's kind of owns the chocolate space, but not much more than that. I mean, they don't really have a big presence in the fruit side of it. Um, and that would mean that probably as we're coming up to uh, Valentine's Day, uh, that would mean that Mars would probably make a lot more money than Hershey's in that kind of space. Uh, we won't have class on Valentine's Day. No, I wonder how many people are going to check the Twitter for night class next week. Or maybe I should tell people they can go to date if they want to. Uh, <laughs> make a date night at Econ 396. Oh my god. Uh, or you can make it a meetup space too. If you don't have someone, you can bring someone. Make it a meetup space. Stand up bitter in conversation. Oh, I'm a movie. Yeah, a movie. Oh, what movie would we see? Crazy Rich Asians. Yeah, that would be a pretty good, uh, what would be a good Valentine's Day movie? I'm thinking Speed. Speed, one or two. I mean, fast pace of a bus. Or Die Hard, yeah, Die Hard would be good. Um, yeah, Scary, yeah, Scary, yeah. Um, Blair Witch Project, though, too, right? Something like that. Yeah, see? Yeah, um, what else? Let's see what the web tells us. They're gonna say, they're gonna say that stupid Tom Hanks movie where the person, La La Land, The Notebook, Romeo and Juliet. Charles Sunshine is Spotless Mind, isn't that the where the guy gets, Breaks up with the one girl and she's like batshit crazy, or maybe he's batshit crazy. Is that what it is? Oh yeah. Yeah 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 yeah. Okay. Well. Um. No, we need something better than that. Um, none of these are good. Uh, none of these. No, my wife, no, she's not going to show up for that. No, she is. Uh, no, um, I already bought her something for Valentine's. I already decided, I already know what I'm going to get her. I haven't bought it yet, but I'm going to buy it. Are, are you, wait, did you just get her the same thing every Valentine's Day? No. Oh, I'm going to get her um, uh, the uh, Apple ear pod things. I know it's a classic, but I know it's not. What? You can get them in different colors? No, I don't Oh, okay. I just know she needs it, and dude, I've been married. I'm married, so it's not like I have to like bring up my game. Like I just have to remember <laughs> that it's Valentine's Day, and that's good enough. Um, oh, I did get her an oversized card last year, but she was pretty mad because then she can't keep it. Like you know, one of those like big, like huge Why ones. Why keep it? What? Why didn't you want to be able to keep it? What wives do? I don't know. That's what they do. Um, they keep cards. Um, okay. Um, okay. Let's go back to this. <laughs> okay. What do I want to make sure that I still cover here? Mm, I'm not going to do that. If you like math, though, you could look at these Lagrangians, but math is obviously not a requirement for this class, so um, there's no prereq for it, so we don't have to worry about this. Um, let me go back to this. So that basically wraps up that discussion of individual market demand. What that basically means is that for, uh, for the Tuesday before Valentine's Day, we will do some, we'll start off the class by doing some problems just like we did for the last topic. Uh, but then I'll basically, uh, it's not gonna take that long. It's not as much material to cover. I'm gonna basically break into production then and cost of production. 
Um, but again, even as you look again forward to the rest of the topics, they largely replicate what we did in 130. It's just a little bit more detailed and a little bit more um, complicated. Um, okay, uh, dude, I'm done. It's 7.05, so go off into the world and cause some havoc. Um, and buy some furniture pads. You, you, you all, did you use U-Haul before? I've almost always used U-Haul. <laughs> I've had some really shitty vehicles and I've had some really nice ones. Um, I should buy, no, seriously, I did say that to my wife. I did actually move enough that I did buy my own hand trunk. So if any of you do have to move, I can lend you my hand trunk. Like the, the dolly, yeah. I can lend you my dolly. Um, I do have my own furniture pads too. Uh, I got a truck. You have a truck, so let's do it. J and T moving. TJ. TJ, that probably is that, yeah. TJ moving. Okay. I'm just surprised if we moved a lot of furniture. No, oh, see, here we go. Specifically beds up. You know what? When I move, I've got all IKEA furniture. It is not moving. My mattress is staying where it is. I'm throwing it. I have almost entirely disposable furniture and stuff. What about you? Uh, so. <laughs> yeah. See, but do you have stuff nice enough that you want to keep it when you move? See, uh, oh no, was it really stressful? Like, was it stressful because of like the employees being like? Oh my God, you're kidding me. Like, so what? There was one in probably like what? One token one on each of the other aisles. What would you have to do? Just like, and people are like, we don't want your stupid. Because yeah, um, what were they selling at the end? Were they still selling them like radio kits by the end, or were they selling? Th I hadn't been in a radio shack for a long time. They had like who buys capacitors? I probably would be. Do they really? I mean, we have a this lot. One, this one gives us employee and I don't have the name anymore. Actually, yeah. Yeah. So usually, yeah, see, that's the thing, <laughs> is that usually they take most of the time. But 
I don't always take all the time. Sometimes I feel though, like the ones that take all of the time are the ones where the professor's like, and you know, I just don't have it in my wheelhouse to do it. And I, I know there's other professors that like doing it where they say, get in a group and spend 20 minutes with your group and solve this problem. And I just don't have the patience for it. That's probably, that, I mean, I guess I can see more value in that. I'm not sure I could deliver that, but who's it? Tell me a name. And I'll tell you. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Because I could think of one that could go easily deliver. Uh, like in English or sort of Java. Oh, yeah. I could do that. Uh, 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 interesting number one. Um, there's others like the person who's using like Torus, for example. Usually it's like a humanities course, like philosophy. Um, the ones that are notorious for getting out early, like college, um, like Yeah, like Torus is like a college. Did you take psych already? Um, I'm taking one psych class. Who was who? I'm taking one psych class that is up for. Did you, you're leaving, did you know that? Yeah. yeah. No, he's leaving. Well, after the semester, not yet. But. Um, 